What's going on, ma'am? I'm just a cab driver. Uh, but there are two people inside the cab. One that looks like she's hunched over, and she has blood coming from her ear. Family's honor is very important in many cultures and usually is viewed as the responsibility of the male to maintain. In many societies across the world, male empowerment and male dominance have been a core thread throughout the ages. This can become exasperated when a male is financially constrained and socially inept, meaning they don't feel in control of their life, so they flex their power over their wives or daughters. Honor killings are known to be when a woman brings disgrace to her family. Traditionally, this surrounds the woman's chastity and happens when a woman is thought to be intimate outside of her marriage or is simply not representing the family in the way that the males want them to. While many times perpetrators try to hide behind the honor killings tradition in an attempt to avoid prosecution, they are aware their actions are of a criminal nature as seen by them trying to conceal their crimes. It lends to the idea that they believe maintaining honor in their family is more important than avoiding criminal consequences. It is not uncommon that families will look to the younger males to carry out the attacks since they would likely receive lesser consequences due to being a minor. In today's video, we are going to look at Yazer Saeed, father that was on the FBI's most wanted list and fled for 12 years. Yazer was born in Egypt and moved to the United States on a visa in 1983. He later met a woman named Patricia. Patricia did not come from a wealthy family. Yazer had the perfect opportunity to sweep her off her feet. He persuaded her family that he would be able to provide for her so they would agree to their marriage. Yazer was 30 years old at the time and Patricia was 15 years old. Yazer's promise was not kept. He was not in a position to provide for her, as he had told her father. He was a cab driver, but he was inconsistent in his work. Patricia had her first child when she was 16 years old. They had three children, a son named Islam and two daughters named Amina and Sarah. We will hear Patricia's sister recount her perception of Patricia and Yazer's early life. Now being married at 15 years of age, did she do that on her own or did she have to seek permission? My mom and dad signed papers. How long did they date before they got married? It wasn't very long. Um, I'm going to say about two months. She moved down with Yasser and Yasser family. Was she still in school? No, she wasn't. Do you remember Patricia worked that time? No, she did not. What about Yasser? Did he work? At that time, I don't believe he was working when they were. At any point, does Patricia become pregnant? Yes. Okay, and when is that? I believe that's about two months after they were married. Yasser's daughters, who were eight and nine years old at the time, told their grandmother that Yazur was abusing them. The grandmother reported the incident and a police report was filed as a result. The girls were eventually persuaded to retract their statements so he would not go to jail. Yazur wielded a lot of power. He frequently videotaped his daughters, sometimes without their knowledge when they were sleeping. Nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Take this blanket from this one in the back. No! Go. No! Get away! Yeah. No! <laughs> this is illegal! Do I better tape you when you're sleeping? Yazur exhibited obsessive and controlling behavior with his daughters. He sometimes followed them to work and recorded through the store window from his car. He would become agitated when he saw his daughter smiling at a customer. Seeing them happy was a trigger for him, as if their happiness could only come from him. She can't see us from inside, right? Oh. Huh? Yeah. She smiled to the customers. Baba, she has to. Part of her job. She's in trouble. He flew Amina to Egypt to find her husband when she was 16 years old. He eventually found her a potential husband who was around 50 years old. He was willing to sell her as a child bride. Amina refused so strongly that she was brought back to the United States without a husband. Yazir frequently took his son Islam to Egypt to keep their culture alive within the males of the household. Men in certain societies are expected to create a code for the women in their life to live by. In Yazir's case, he expected to have a family that followed his culture despite them being born and raised within Western culture. 
As he realized his daughters were not obliging, he grew frustrated and likely felt out of control. He claimed his daughters were becoming too westernized and were disobeying his concerns such as not dating, especially American boys. They kept their relationships hidden from their father because he would not approve. Amina had a close relationship with one of her boyfriend's family. She had sent an email to her boyfriend's mother. She said things like, when my father kills me, in some of the emails. She would also tell her boyfriend things like, when I die, stay positive and don't hurt yourself. Nazir discovered a note between her and her boyfriend one day. He became enraged and beat her. He demanded her boyfriend's name, but she endured the beatings to protect him. We will hear from Amina's boyfriend recount the dynamic of their relationship and how she felt about her father. And while you're dating, she's telling you this needs to be in secret? Yes. Okay. And she can't date? Correct. So, what did you guys do? Did you, were you able to take her bride screen? Were you able to take her to the movies? How would you see Amina? Well, uh, she said that her, uh, she repeatedly had remember saying, her father was crazy, was obsessed about what she did, what she did and not do, that uh, he would pick the guy she, she would marry, uh, what car she would drive, how much money she had in the bank, uh, where she would go, because he uh, he wanted to control who her, her lifestyle. So did that mean that you could see her? Could you go to her house? No, we never, never went to the movies, we never uh, did anything that normal dating relationships So you could never take on a proper date? Not at all. We could not be seen uh, together, we could not talk on the phone, we could not text. So the only time I would see her is when uh, she signed up for a tennis class in school. How would you see her then? Well, she signed up for a tennis class. Um, her and Sarah were really smart and really loved sports and they were really good with sports and uh, at some point she decided to drop the class that uh, she preferred if we start dating. So we see her instead of going to that period of class, we will spend time together. So she signed up for a tenant class but that was really a cover up because that was a way for her to see you Well initially she had signed up for it because she wanted to be in sports and keep her LBC because she expressed that her house, she felt like a dog. You know, she, her father constantly put her, his son, Islam, to, uh, to, uh, spy on her. So she felt like if she could spend time in doing sports, it would give her some freedom. When Amina was finally 18, she knew she had to do something about her living situation. She was very afraid and confided in one of her teachers. Amina emailed her teacher describing what she had endured and her plans to run away. Parts of the email read, You shouldn't. Anyways, we are running away, hopefully before the break ends. I know that he will search until he finds us, and he will without any drama or doubt us. I work for my mother, but she would tell him out of fear. We can't bring her, and I can only hope she doesn't get hurt. We love you, Miss Hopkins, and feel like you understand us. All that I'm asking you to do is to go, is go talk to all of mine and especially Sarah's teachers and tell them not to relay any information to my parents whatsoever, please. Also, is it illegal for Sarah to leave? She's only 17. How will we finish school? And can he track us from that? Should we change our names? Please help us out. Thank you so much for everything. Wish us luck. Again, Mrs. Hopkins, we will get the law involved. Again, Mrs. Hopkins, we will get the law involved. If we keep this between us. We need our chance to get settled. Because when he goes to jail, his brothers will step in. Think this through. You don't know how they think. Heck, I live with them and still don't understand it. Amina and Sarah had a private meeting with their boyfriends about running away. Amina was very fearful for her life since Yazir recently pulled a gun on her. The four of them decided to flee. Amina's boyfriend convinced her that she should bring her mother along since she was a victim as well. Amina, Sarah, Patricia, and both of their boyfriends piled into a truck and drove to Tulsa, Oklahoma the day after Christmas in 2007. They settle into the apartment and start looking for jobs. They were planning on staying there for a long period of time, if not indefinitely. They crushed the SIM cards in their phones because they fear that Yazir could track them. Patricia felt bad about leaving Yazir after only a few days. She was apparently in contact with Islam, her son, and Yazir the entire time they were gone. 
Patricia tricks her daughters into returning back to Yazur in Texas. She tells them that they should spend New Year's in Texas and that she needs to go visit her mother's grave because it is the anniversary of her death. When they arrived back in Texas, Amina stayed with her boyfriend at his parents' house while Sarah and Patricia went back to Yazur. Amina's boyfriend received text messages from Sarah. Patricia then drove over to Amina's boyfriend's house to go get her. We will hear him recount the interaction of the last time he saw Amina. Can I explain to you what you mean by forcible takeover? Um, we sat down and my parents sat down with her and expressed her, our concerns for her. Uh, Let me does Patricia show up? Yes. What time of day? Um, around 5 or 6. The same day, January 1st? Yes. So it's now evening. You received the text message at 8.43 a.m. and it's now the evening time. Yes. Does Patricia show up alone? Yes. Okay. Has she been calling throughout the day? She had been using Sarah to uh, get text in Amina to come home. So she Similar to the text message, she was asking Sarah to keep telling Amina to come home. Yes. Okay. And Amina is responding or not responding? No, she said multiple times that she didn't want to come home. So then Patricia shows up on your parents' doorstep. Yes. You let her in? Yes. And do you have a conversation with Patricia about Amina returning home? Yes. What do you tell Patricia? That, um, that she should be concerned about Amina's and Sarah's safety. Uh, that she should not take her daughters back home. Okay. And did that work? No. So did Amina go in fact home with Patricia? Yes. She kept saying that uh, that they needed to go, that we're running out of time, that they needed to go back home. Patricia said they were running out of time. Yes. Okay. So did Amina tell you that she wanted to go or she didn't want to go? She didn't want to go. Okay, what did you tell me? Um, I told her that I had made a decision for her a week ago on the 24th. This is why I had said, bring your sister and bring your mom. So in case our relationship didn't work out, your mom would take care of you. And then for, for Sarah's safety, she will be with you when we ran away. And now it was her decision to make whether she wanted to go or not. And she said she didn't want to go. And then Patricia just grabbed her by the hand and took her. Did Amina say anything to you before she left? Yes, that uh, I have felt her. What did you say? Yeah, uh, Amina said that I have felt her to protect her and help her. She said that I would never see her again. This is the last time I will ever see her. Then she walked out. She had said her, her father was her. By this point, Yazur realizes that he does not have control of his family anymore and that he almost lost them to the Western world, as he called it. Presumably, he is now fully aware of their boyfriends and the secrets they've kept from him for some time. Now that the girls have returned, Yazur persuades the girls to accompany him to dinner so they can talk. The three of them get into Yazur's cab to head to dinner. Yazur pulls into a hotel parking lot and opened fire. He shot at his two daughters, hitting Amina twice and Sarah nine times. After the initial altercation, Sarah called 911 and used her last bit of energy to plead for help. This is the censored 911 call. What's going on, ma'am? I'm just not Serving fire department. Ma'am, are you still here? Yazer immediately fled the scene and went into hiding. The investigators could not locate him. About six years passed and Yazir was placed on the FBI's most wanted list in 2014. The case remained cold until 2017. A maintenance worker at an apartment complex was sent to an apartment in Bedford, Texas to assist with a water leak. He was going to let himself in with the master key because no one seemed to be home. He noticed a deadbolt had been installed on the door. Since he was unable to open the door, he knocked again, and this time a man answered. He recognized the man as Yazer. When the maintenance worker informed his boss that he had just seen Yazer, the boss stated that he was aware that Islam, his son, was renting the property. When the cops arrive without a warrant, Islam answers the door and refuses to let them in. The cops then go get a warrant, but when they return to the apartment, Yazer vanished. The case is once again cold for another three years. 
the investigators had been monitoring his relatives since they predicted that they must be helping him hide. In 2020, they suspected Yazur is at his niece's house. After monitoring the house, they noticed Islam, his son, frequently bringing bags of trash out of the house and dumping them in a dumpster down the road. The officers take the trash bags and conduct DNA testing on some of the items. They eventually find a match with Yazur's DNA. On August 26, 2020, they broke down the door and discovered Yazur in the back of the house. He was finally apprehended after 12 years in hiding since the horrific night he took his daughter's lives. We will hear Yazir explain his reasons for hiding, despite him claiming innocence during his court testimony. Note, the court required him to speak Arabic in order to keep the records clear, so he has a translator. You didn't show up to their funerals. Yeah, because of the unfair and hateful media coverage at that time. There was no evidence, but all the accusation was against me, and I did not go. How would I go? Yazir had a different story of what happened to the night his daughter's lives ended. He stated that he was driving with his daughters and that he felt like he was being followed by some unknown person. Despite him feeling scared, he left his gun and daughters in the car. We will hear him recount his sequence of events during his court testimony. I was planning to take them to dinner and have a talk over the dinner, but I felt somebody was following me, so I could, did not continue. What point do you, if you remember, and I know this is a long time ago, but how soon after you left the home did you feel like you were being followed? When I was going down 121, I didn't suspect anything, but when I went on Route 14, I felt somebody was following me. Did you discuss this with your daughter? I told them, I think there is one car or more than one car following us. Who, um, did you have any idea who you thought might be following you? Because of the headlights, you could see a car, you could see there is people in the car, but you cannot tell who is in the car. At this point, what decision do you make because you're feeling like you're being followed? So I stopped at Riverside Drive, I opened the door and I ran into uh, across to a wooden and tree area and I thought if they are my daughter's friend, let them solve the problem together if they have issues. The car is yours, you do whatever you want, since they know how to drive, I left the car for them. When you said you exited Riverside, do you remember specifically um, what, where did you pull over and, and exit the cab? When you left on foot, am I correct from what you said earlier that you believe that if there was a threat, that threat would follow you? Of course, because I was thinking they were trying to get off me personally. When you decided to leave on foot, to potentially draw this threat away and leaving them with the car, when were you going to reconnect with your daughter? At that point, I did not have a plan in mind. I went on foot, hoping that I will see one of my friends and maybe he will give me a ride, but I did not have a specific plan of what to do at that point for them also. Was there, were you scared about the situation? That's very dangerous. 
I felt close to somebody will be coming and asking me while I have my children with me. So yes, it was a scary situation. Yazer was questioned why he carried a gun and why he left it behind despite being scared someone was going to harm him. So what did you do with your gun? Because it's a dangerous area where I'm going to work at night, I would take my gun with me and place it between the seat and the cubby. But not every day. You left the in the car, is that what you're saying? Yes. But you were so scared, you didn't take the gun with you. He was shot. How would I carry and go in the street with it. You were scared, right? I hid by myself. I didn't think I would need the gun. Was I dreaming that somebody was following me then? You tell me. Yazir described how he found out about his daughter's fate. When do you first learn when do you first start to hear about what has happened to your daughter? It took me some time to get into the Waffle House. I don't know how long because I was going on my feet. I arrived or as soon as I arrived, there was, I heard that something has happened to somebody. But I don't know who. When I arrived to the Waffle House, I heard some talking about some accident. Um, but I wasn't sure what it was it about. They were talking about the accident. And that's how I know there was an accident. Yazir was then asked where he went after he ran away from the cab. His response was nonspecific and showed that he was being backed into a corner during questioning. Where did you go? You didn't go home? I'm familiar with that area. I was hanging around in that area. Until when? A while. I don't remember how long. So you just stayed at the Waffle House until 2020? You just hung out at the Waffle House? When asked if Yazir loved his daughters, he felt the need to validate his answer. He could have answered with a simple yes or no. But he makes a point to mention that the vacations and pictures he took with his family showed his love. It is not uncommon for an abuser to document good memories with their victims to show the world that they are a good person. A loving parent would have likely just agreed with the question and felt confidence in the words that they were saying. Yazir's need to validate his answer shows he does not believe what he is saying is true. Did you love your daughter? Certainly, and my trips with them, my vacation with them, the hundreds of tapes that I have with them and for them certainly proves it. Patricia was devastated that she lost her whole family in one night. She lost her two daughters as well as her son. She always knew Yazir had a hold on their son from the beginning. And she went on to say that their son, Islam, was brainwashed. It's likely that since Islam was little, Yazir instilled certain values into him. It wouldn't be surprising if Yazir reminded Islam that it was his duty as a man to maintain honor for his family. One may wonder why Islam, their brother, helped his father hide for so many years. Many times when family members are accomplices, they feel their actions are culturally accepted within the family and see their actions as heroic. As previously mentioned, Yazir was originally from Egypt. A reminder that this is not a generalization of people from Egypt, but rather an evaluation of Egyptian laws and the statements it made to certain people that are violently prone. A 2015 law article discusses laws in Egypt surrounding honor killing. Egypt had been known to have lenient laws regarding honor killings. Article 237 of Egyptian Penal Code No. 58 allows for lesser punishment for men that harm their wives on the basis of adultery. This then leaves the opinion up to the judge and whether they agree 
that this was a necessary step in restoring honor to the victim's family. Note that honor killings are not a direct link with any religion. There has been evidence that shows these acts predate any modern religion. While this is slightly different from Yazur's situation, he did grow up in Egypt, and knowing these lenient laws reinforces the acceptance for the act of killing for honor within his culture. For perspective, the leniency in certain countries remained until the Yazur case. This case brought more awareness to the excuse of honor that some used to avoid being heavily prosecuted. For example, it took the United Arab Emirates until 2020 to outlaw honor kings. The defense maintained that Yazur was innocent the whole time. They said that Sarah's 911 call was not reliable to prosecute Yazur due to the difficulty understanding the audio. They also claimed that Sarah could have been hallucinating since she was losing so much blood. Lastly, the defense claimed that this was not a fair investigation since they never considered any other suspects. They tried to allude to the idea that it could have been one or both of their boyfriends. The following footage is a news press during the trial. My reaction is that when this first happened, I wish the Irving Police Department had done a, an investigation, which they never did. The FBI never investigated it. Nobody ever got phone records. And unfortunately, I think those are, it's too late to get them now from anybody. So we will never know who actually killed the girls. Now we are very, very sorry that they were killed. Uh, me and Sarah sound like they were wonderful people. Um, but my client, Yasser Syed, has always told me he never did it. Uh, from the very first day I met him when he came to our jail in 2020 and until now, that has not ever changed. He may get the declaration from Sarah Saeed who thinks her father. As the state's expert witnesses said, um, a person who has been like that and is losing oxygen can have auditory and, you know, visual hallucinations, they can be in a mental state such that they will, you know, create things when things are not there. Now, unfortunately, that's all they ever went on. Take note when the lawyer mentions honor killings. He states that if someone did an honor killing, wouldn't they be proud of it and not try to hide it? As we've mentioned earlier in the video, this is to restore honor within the family, but the perpetrators are still aware of the criminal consequences. So yes, they are going to try to hide it, especially in a country that does not have any leniency toward it. Uh, it never was about an honor thing. If, you, if you're doing an honor thing, why in God's name would you not fess up to it? It makes no sense to me. Yazur was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Islam Yazur's son received 10 years in prison for helping his father evade capture for 12 years. Do you believe Yazur's story? Or was it to restore honor in the family? Was everyone but Yazur a victim? Or were some just a part of it as he was? Thank you to our Patreons. We really appreciate your support. We want to give a big thank you to Buckethead, Dark Entries, Nexus, and Big Pepperoni Pizza. If you would like to get the uncensored and other content, feel free to join our Patreon today. Link in the description below. Thank you for watching and join us next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.